Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. So this is another story from the Paladin DM that also goes by Lord Althory. If you like his work you should check out his subscribe star to support him directly or check out his YouTube channel linked down below. And with that out of the way let's get into the story. Morn left the area swiftly, commandeering the Valkyrie and flying ahead with the mauled Guards woman. The weight of the Astartes was such that only one could go, and so Morn went, his one-eyed glare daring any to challenge him. As the Valkyrie departed, the Astartes began to find their way back down. They moved back down, pondering what the Xenos meant to accomplish. Well Andriel, you're the expert in sorcery, what are they up to? Constantine asked at length. Aside from breaking my sword. He grumbled. I have absolutely no idea. The goals of the Xenos are as obscure to me as they are to you. Andriel admitted, head still aching from the backlash. It's possible that this was some form of elaborate trap meant to remove us from the field but it would have made more sense for the lictors to engage us during the middle of an assault if that were the case. You have any idea why the Wathin? Aishvan asked. Nay, though they are most certainly engaged in some trickery or another. I can't say what it is though, just a certainty in my bones. The old wolf grumbled. I've fought the Tyranid on a dozen dozen worlds, and they've never behaved like this. Assassinating leaders? Absolutely, it's usually a prelude. But they never cared much about Sickers, the shadow in the warp covers that area. So why does this fleet engage in such an abnormal manner? Constantine grumbled. It begins with a simple enough attack, spore bombardment, eliminating the capital, and spreading outwards. Perhaps it recognizes that direct assault is futile, but if so, why so few forces committed to subterfuge, why develop a creature simply to attack Sickers when they are no threat to it? I don't know. The Xeno has always been hard to read, and now more so than ever. We also have received no contact from the fleet or from the other hives. Combine this with these recent attacks and it seems clear to me that they mean to isolate us, but for what purpose I can't say. Regardless, something is coming, something big. They threw titans at us, what oh. Andriel said. Targeting sickers, isolating the hive. Ensuring there is no support from orbit. You don't suppose. A Norn queen. There's one on the planet. Constantine finished, in a mix of awe and excitement. The most important creature in the hive fleet. If it was indeed here, and they could kill it, then it would shatter the fleet. It is certainly a possibility. Wathin considered. Though to see one deployed is rare in the extreme. There are only two circumstances which come to mind, both from the early stages of the Tyrannic Wars. The Xeno have not dared to deploy their leaders since. Constantine fell silent. I am eager to face the foe, but if such power as has not been unleashed since then will fall upon us, even I would advise caution. We nearly lost one of our number and may yet lose the best of the Alverans to a mere lictor. What comes next, we must be prepared for. Ishvan said. His fists clenched. Indeed. I'm going to need to get a new sword. Constantine remarked, examining his bent and dented blade. The power field was no longer functional, sparking uselessly, and it was bent badly enough that it could not be sheathed. I can take care of that. Ishvan suggested, brightening slightly, reaching out and taking the weapon. He moved forwards with greater purpose. Longer legs beginning to carry him in front of the rest of the team. Does this hive have access to the necessary components? Constantine asked, having not exactly given the salamander his sword, and mildly alarmed at no longer having it. It should, there are sororitas here, and the guard use them as well. Those are for different models. I'll improvise. Ishvan called back, then vanished around a corner. Constantine, in a less than dignified manner, Hurried to catch up, but the salamander had made like a purple orc and disappeared. How? 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 The Templar turned towards the remaining two marines in confusion. Is he also a sicker? He demanded to know. Andriel blew air out his nose in amusement. 
Absolutely not. You have more psychic potential than he does. He's in a hurry to do something to distract himself. Constantine cocked his head to the side. Distract himself? The salamanders care a great deal for mortals. I suspect he's concerned for Atra. Andriel explained. Really I thought you'd be acting the same way with how much time you spent trying to teach her. Constantine crossed his arms. Oh ye of little faith. Either she lives, and Morn shall reforge her into a new weapon for the Emperor, or she dies, and is born to the God Emperor's side. A martyr's death is the best one can hope for. HM. Was all Andriel responded to that with. Well, the best a mortal can hope for. It will be a shame to lose the propaganda, she was good for morale. Now if you will excuse me brother, I must go and meditate. He replied, and moved away. He's in an ill temper. Constantine noted towards Wathin. I imagine the shadows giving him a headache. Rune Priest mentioned it to me once. The space wolf said with a shrug. The pair continued onwards, taking a moment to process. We should go and re-review the defenses, since Morn is occupied. Constantine said after a long moment of awkward silence. I'll handle it lad. The old wolf said, laying a hand on the Templar's shoulder. Go and pray. You can fool the sicker but not me. I am quite fine. Thank you Wathin. Guardsmen die, such is their duty. Constantine said, shrugging the older marine off and moving forwards. You've never seen a brother die in front of you yet have you? Wathin said, and Constantine turned. Seen it happen when a blood claw looses packmates, damn fools. Cuts the aura of invincibility down doesn't it? Constantine clenched his fist. Be silent. He said, voice angry. You nearly lost a brother, and a friend besides. Because we aren't invincible, and we can die. I am not weak. I do not fear. Constantine growled. Then you're an idiot. Wathin replied. And have been lucky enough to feel invincible for some time because you're talented for your age, presumably around equally talented brothers. Constantine whirled at this slight to his honor, fist lashing out at Wathin's face. The old wolf caught his arm and stepped in, slamming his palm forwards into the Templar's breastplate. Off balance, Constantine fell back, flat on his back. That wouldn't have worked if you were focused. Wathin noted. The Templar got back up, still furious, but seeing clearly through the anger. He did not move. You aren't invincible, you can die, and you will die if you go to battle without your own head in order. So go, pray, meditate, train, drink, and get yourself in order before the next fight. Wathin said, ordering him not from rank but from the authority which all old and wise men hold over young and foolhardy ones. Constantine did not respond, but turned away. You and I shall have a matter of honor to settle upon the watch fortress, cousin. Then we will settle it there, but have your head in order or I'll put you back on your ass in the training cages. Wathin replied, and the two parted ways. As the old wolf walked back towards the central spire and his next duty, he smiled slightly. Yes. He had stung the pup's honor, but he had needed it. What was the high marshal thinking, sending that one, barely more than a scout, to the death watch? Perhaps the Templars wanted to be rid of him, he was unusually tolerant and cool-headed for the heirs of Sigismund. Then he chuckled. Unusually tolerant, but even more arrogant than usual, it had been quite a long while since he had faced an honor duel from anyone besides a son of the lion. Most young claws weren't quite stupid enough to challenge him, and he wasn't fool enough to draw challenge from the old guard. Oh well, Constantine was finally going to get that match between them after all. Despite his fury, Constantine found his steps guided, as they ever were, by faith. Until he came before the great cathedral of Saint Augustine of the Silent. The Silent Saint was not as well known as some, but Constantine knew of her. A mute saint. She had appeared on the world of a person M35. In her youth she forsook civilization and lived among the wilds, protected by the emperor, until a demonic invasion had fallen upon the world. With nary a word, she banished the forces of chaos, rallying an army of the humble about her, and defeating a mighty prince of chaos in utter silence, empowered by the emperor with martial skill beyond her primitive origins. 
He removed his helmet in respect, and anointed himself with the sacred water as he entered. The cathedral was nearly full this evening, as the faithful gathered to pray and seek peace. As he walked through the cathedral, they parted before him, some reaching out fingers in silent or to catch the hem of his robe or graze his power armor. He did not begrudge them. The masses required faith, symbols of hope to remind them always of the emperor's light. He was such a symbol, or at least was meant to be. He approached the altar and bowed his head. Upon the floor were graven sacred words, passages from the Lictitio Divinitus, the divine word of the emperor. The author of the sacred text was somewhat debated, the true author, or authors, as many posited lost to history, though it had undoubtedly been divinely inspired. Privately, Constantine held that it had been composed by Rogel Dawn during his vigil upon Holy Terror. Sigismund, the first Templar, had been among the first to recognize the divinity of the God Emperor, surely Dawn must have as well. Furthermore, from where else could such beautiful and persuasive prose arise as was found in the Lictitio, if not from a Primarch? He took comfort in the divine words, reaffirming his faith by the impenetrable arguments therein. Each word was like the breath of paradise, even for one so accustomed to higher senses and experiences, they were a sort of holy bliss. He meditated upon them, and found peace. Indeed, he had been struck by momentary doubt, but the moment of weakness was overcome by the all-consuming will and power of the god emperor. Indeed, he was a son of the emperor, and he would usher in a penance tenfold for the moment of sin, paid in Zeno's blood. Yet as Constantine was elevated to divine peace, Atra had succumbed to hell. She saw, but did not understand, her mind feverish and tormented. The stimulant which preserved her life was meant for a start, not mortals. Its effect upon her brain was to stimulate it beyond reason, and fevers racked her body. This left her mind hyperactive but unfocused, experiencing far heightened emotions. If she was capable of being sick, she would have vomited until her stomach tore, but she could not move, could not think, and could not die. She had enough presence of mind to recognize a shift from outside to inside, moved swiftly. Her world had transcended pain at the moment of sacrifice, and she could no longer feel anything, perceptions overloaded and shattered. She wondered briefly why her nose seemed so large, or why one of her eyes could not open. She passed again into a smaller room and a thunderous voice filled the air, though she could not tell what it said. Was that the voice of the emperor? The roar faded, and red and silver blurs moved around and above her. For a moment she focused on a pair of metal eyes, struggling to remember and place the exact memory. The emotion related was fear, then calm, and she could not entirely understand why. She felt something prick her neck, then a pressure there. The burning began to fade slightly, but not the confusion. She could feel again, cold, the cold of metal on her back, cool air on open skin. Where had her armor gone? She was going to need that. Bugger that. Where were her clothes? She was an officer now, it wouldn't do for the officer to go about in the nude. Her head shifted slightly in protest, and she felt cold tubes by her ear. She tried to rise, but found she could not. She tried to lift her arm, but it wouldn't respond. She looked towards it, and saw the seal of the cog on the back of a red blur. Mechanicus. No this didn't make sense she wasn't near any Mechanicus she was moving to support the Astartes, she didn't have time for the Mechanicus. There was a Zeno, the Astropaths were in danger. Memories of pain struck her, blinding blue light and sudden darkness. She couldn't see what was to the other side of her, but something moved. With great effort, she turned her head and the leering cybernetic face of a servitor stared back at her. She began to panic, breathing heavily, limbs jerking, why wouldn't her arms respond? She struggled to raise it, and it would not respond. She rasped for air, unable to breathe, she tried to scream but her throat only hurt as she bucked on the table. Strong, cold hands restrained her, and a metal limb pushed a mask over her face. She kicked and struggled, not understanding mind white with terror. She couldn't breathe, she couldn't breathe. Her eye fixed on a series of mechanical components, limbs, claws, a metal eye. No. She was loyal. She was loyal. She was loyal. She bolted up in bed, 
screaming and covered in a cold sweat. Strong arms pushed her back down and she struggled. Atra. Atra be calm, it is me. You are going to be alright. A voice insisted. She focused on the face. It was dark, too dark, with glowing red eyes, but kindly and full of concern. Ish? She asked, in her haste forgetting her manners. Ah, that is, Lord Ishvan? Yes. It's me. Ish replied. You were very badly injured, but it seems you will live. He said happily. Although, you may have to take some time to grow accustomed to the changes. Changes? Atra asked, and then she noticed. Her right arm was gone, and in its place shone a steel limb, ending in a five talon claw. She turned it, and the talon moved like her arm. She clenched it, and released. There was a sense of feeling, but with the ever slightest of delays, and muffled, like touching something through a glove. The metal also encompassed much of her body, strands of iron weaving across and under her skin. Most of her left arm had been reconstructed with similar cybernetics. She lifted her left arm, the arm that was still at least somewhat human, to her face. Two of the fingers were gone, replaced with artificial ones. She touched her face. The left side was still warm, but the left was cold steel. Her hair was gone as well, but it seemed most of her scalp was intact. She lay back in a state of shock, then noted her clothing and armor were still gone. Hurriedly she pulled up the blanket she had thrown off on awakening to cover herself. Uh, where are my pants? She asked at length. It was easier to focus on that problem than on the small problem of most of the right side of her body being gone. They are by the side of your bed. Are you able to stand? Aishvan asked. I, I'm not sure. Did they replace my legs too? Only a section of your upper thigh and femur. It should be mostly the same. There are enhancements throughout to integrate your body with your replacements, but the core is still biological. Atra sighed in relief. At least she was still mostly human. She slowly swung her feet over the edge of the bed. Just as Aishvan had warned her, her legs were run through with the same telltale signs of cybernetic meddling. She rose gingerly, but found her balance seemed to be mostly intact. There was a definite weight on her right side now, but not so much it threw her balance off severely. This, she looked down at herself and stared. I, I lost half my body. This shouldn't feel this natural. She said in astonishment. You'd have to ask Morn for the details. I simply made a few tweaks to your arm. I shouldn't said with a shrug. It should hopefully serve you well. I suppose I will. She said, examining herself. It didn't seem like her body. Her body didn't have wires running through it, or metal tubes under her skin. How long was I down for? Two days. Fortunately the Tyranids haven't made any further moves. Some sort of cloud rolled in during the night we faced the Lictor, but nothing's come of it, and it seems natural. Storms roll in all the time here. This one's quiet, I can't hear it. Then she paused. Ishvan, do you hear singing? It was faint, strange, and yet beautiful, like the song sung on the day of the Emperor's Ascension or Sanguinola, but different. It seemed artificial, and yet perfectly understandable, almost familiar. The marine paused, and then shook his head. No, there's a good deal of noise from the manufactorum, but if there's singing I can't hear it over that. It could be the binary cant. That noise? No I don't think so. Gives me a headache. I am no expert on cybernetics. Wait here, I will go and inform Morn that you have awoken. Ishvan said, and left. Atra stood alone in the room, looking at her reflection in the smooth surface of the wall. Her face was gone, a metal mask covering half of it. A red eye stared back at her, cold and soulless. Her artificial fist clenched, and she punched the reflection, denting the steel and leaving an impact. She breathed heavily, tears falling from her one remaining eye, breaths ragged, then she composed herself, and dressed in the provided robes. She lived, and only in death did duty end. Morn rose from his meditative work as his senses registered the arrival of Aishvan. He was still in the process of attempting to repair the storm till and gunship they had arrived in. The work to restore the bellicose machine spirit and undo the damage wrought by the Xeno was slow particularly given the lack of proper components. 
This forge, while not lacking in zeal or competence, did not possess the requisite resources or expertise to maintain such a craft. She is awake then. He said, turning to meet the salamander. Yes, she's awake, and the repairs to her lungs were fully successful. Ishvan replied with a slight joke. Morn looked at him in confusion. Why did you evaluate her lungs? You are not an apothecary or a tech priest. Ishvan sighed. It's a joke, brother. She woke up screaming like the night haunter was after her, may his bones freeze. If a child cries when it is born that means it is healthy. Morn nodded in acknowledgement. I have not been present for any childbirths, excepting my own. I was not aware of such things. Why are you aware of this? The salamanders do not set ourselves apart from our people. Ishvan replied. Many of my brothers spend the brief days of respite among the very villages we once dwelt in as mortals. But you are set apart. Why do you bother with such things? Morn asked. Why do the Mechanicus sing, after your own manner, or you care for our good goods woman? Ishvan replied. To remind yourselves that you are still human, even if reforged for a new purpose. Morn nodded. A logic built on somewhat shaky axioms, but nonetheless arriving at a correct conclusion. Flesh is weak, but iron alone is abomination. He said, and made a warding sign against the abominable intelligence. The two men began to walk, speaking as they did so. Apart from her lung function and the expected panic on awakening, how is she? Morn asked. You know if I didn't know you better I'd almost think you made a joke. Ishvan noted. She seems to be doing as well as can be expected. She was able to stand and dress herself, and appeared to be fully lucid. However, she may be experiencing some manner of auditory hallucinations. She claimed to be able to hear music. Morn stopped and blinked, his new eye blinking slightly slower than the other one. That is unusual. She shouldn't be able to understand that. Wait, it's not something you've done? No it absolutely is, but not something I've done intentionally, which makes it unusual. You're telling me you accidentally gave her even more modifications? No, but it is likely a side effect, albeit an unintentional one. It is possible that the machine spirit of her bionics has done it. They actually do beneficial things? Occasionally. But she is not an acolyte of the Omnisia, it shouldn't even be active, let enough aware and active enough to be doing that. Well you are, and you handled the actual installation. HM. Morn said, and continued on with somewhat more purposeful stride. How are the repairs to Constantine's blade coming? Having to improvise. It's likely to be less powerful than it was before given the components, though I may have a way to compensate for that, which I'm certain he'll enjoy. What do you have in mind? Morn asked. Brother, I am a son of Vulcan, what do you expect? Ishvan asked, almost insulted. Morn smiled under his helmet. Go and finish it, I'm certain he shall approve. I will attend to this matter. Ishvan nodded and left to return to his work. Morn approached the room where Aetha was waiting, and checked his sensors. There were few tech priests in the area. He quickly checked the internal cameras and audio and began to feed them a stream of secondary data before entering the room. It was time to test if he had made the error he feared he did. Aetra stood to attention and saluted, her new arm making a clink as it struck the metal of her skull. Activating a modification in his throat, he spoke, his words translating from his mind to a stream of binary. At ease captain. It is good that you are moving about so quickly. Aetra went to ease, or at least to at ease as she could me. I'm surprised to be moving about at all my lord. I wish to express my gratitude towards you for saving my life, she said. There was that slight, reluctant pause. She was indeed grateful, but the change was sudden, uncomfortable, something she could not quite fully thank him for doing to her. Morn did not begrudge her it. She was a guardsman, not a servant of the machine god. She was a mere mortal, overused to mortal flesh and sinew. The Echo Shiaki had taught that the flesh was holy, humanity found in the flesh. This was folly, but he had taken much of it from her, even if it was to save her life. He was also somewhat distracted, and concerned that she had understood the binary clearly. In fact, 
she likely did not even understand that he had used it. This could prove a problem. She was not of the omnisiac, she should not know this. It would have to be dealt with sooner rather than later. It would appear you received more than was expected. You can hear the Beneric cant and understand it. He explained. This should not be so. I am uncertain what has caused it, but you will not speak of this to anyone until I can determine what code has transmitted it and remove it. He said firmly. If she was discovered, the consequences would be severe for them both. I see. Understood my lord. Ata replied. Pardon my asking, but what exactly did you do to me? She asked, raising her talon. Besides the obvious. You may not want me to answer that. Morn warned. An unfortunate consequence of your state was that you were unable to be totally sedated for much of the process. Local anesthetics were used, along with a drug which prevented the formation of memories, but you were conscious for much of the process. Detailed discussion may trigger partially formed memories. Atra shivered, stomach twisting at the half-remembered nightmares that had plagued her sleep. Though they hadn't been nightmares, and she hadn't been asleep. But she steeled herself. If she did not understand her body or her new limitations, she would die again. She met the space marine's gaze with her own, which was somewhat easier now, had she gotten taller? It's my body, I need to know what it can do. Morn nodded. The damage to you was extensive, and the modifications necessarily needed to be equally so. On the most obvious level, your arm, half your torso, one of your lungs, your eye, most of your face, and a section of your brain were entirely unsalvageable or were completely destroyed, as such they have been replaced. However, such extensive modifications also place additional strain on the rest of your anatomy. It was necessary to remove your spine as the plasma explosion had weakened it. You are now 3 inches taller as a result. Modifications were also made to your ribs. Of them, all on the explosion side of the body have been replaced, along with half to act as anchors on the other side. Your sternum has also been replaced, and many of your other major bones have been supplemented to reduce the effect of deep plasma burn. Morn continued. Atra sat back down, a half-remembered vision flashing through her mind. She remembered the part about the spine, flashes of numbness and agony traveling up her body. It was like a progression of electric shocks to each part of her body, nerves fluctuating between uselessness and sharp bursts of pain which lingered. She felt vaguely nauseous, but controlled herself. Your lung was replaced, as was your liver and stomach. Your primary heart had received only moderate damage and so was able to be repaired. Morn continued. Um, Morn, I only had one heart, you didn't stick another one in me did you? Atra asked. No. It is a pattern of habit. A starts have two. Morn explained without missing a beat, then continued. Your appendix was also removed. It was not damaged, it was simply useless and a source of potential future trouble. Unfortunately, cybernetic replacements for reproductive organs cannot be manufactured, so you are now sterile. He informed her as coldly and calmly as if he had told her she had gotten her hair cut. Your pancreas also received minor repairs. Nearly everything. Atra heard the point about children vaguely, but it was simply one more layer of loss on top of countless more. It seemed there was no segment of her still meaningfully and totally human. She felt shell-shocked, like a bomb had gone off next to her. What about these? She asked, holding up her and gesturing towards the wires. The proximity of the blast to you caused notable damage throughout all the major muscle tissues of your body. Even areas not directly damaged by the blast suffered severe burns and scarring throughout their structures. They would have healed improperly, resulting in severe pain and loss of function leading to paralysis. As such, the damaged tissues were removed and replaced. They have not totally replaced your existing muscular structure, but are integrated within it. This required the implementation of a general enhancement and supplemental system to your own circulatory system to properly deliver resources to your body and ensure that what remains will fully heal. Morn concluded. Down to every muscle then. A total integration of steel and flesh. Atra sat for a moment in sheer awe and no small amount of horror at what had been done to her. Something like this was beyond any real story she had heard of. 
Yes, prosthetics were nothing new. Many in the regiment had them. Feth, even some of the most famed heroes of the Imperium, Yerik, Strachan and the like were as much machine as man. Were all prosthetics so advanced, they couldn't be. What Morn was describing was nothing short of completely rebuilding her entire body. Why? She asked at length. Why expend so many resources, so much effort and talent on one good woman? I know for a fact that all of these are worth more than my life. Blood of my fathers, I've had it hammered into my head that my plasma gun was more important than my life to the Imperium so why the sudden change? I'm one woman among trillions, why this? You are one in perhaps a trillion, or more likely one in 100 billion. Morn replied. There are very few mortals who can boast that they have directly saved the life of an Astartes, fewer still who can say they did so in the manner you did. You risked and gave your life without hesitation, and to full effect. Such individuals are rare, and sorely needed in this age. They cannot be allowed to go to waste. Atra lifted her head. You know, you may be the one person in the galaxy who's completely absent of any bullshit. And even knowing that I have a hard time believing you. I'm a nobody, a statistic. Five months in the guard will make that clear, five years makes you really believe it. You were. But you are not so any longer. Whether you intended to become so or not, you are the hero of Alvara now. Your life is no longer so cheap that it is easily expended. You are of course still may be, if the reward is high enough or your sacrifice becomes necessary once more, but there is no soul in all the dominion of the Emperor, from the lowest serf to even the Astartes and the Custodes this is not true of. And. He concluded. You saved my life, and potentially the life of my battle brothers. I had the power to save yours, I could not allow that debt to remain unpaid. It is a stain on my honor that I required it of you, I would not compound that stain by allowing you to trade your life for mine. Such is not your duty. Right. So what all can I do now? Atra asked, gesturing towards the dent in the wall. I think I already figured out I'm quite a bit stronger. Correct, and this will improve as your natural tissues recover. You will likely achieve a 125% increase in overall strength. Compounded by the fact your natural limiters should now no longer activate, as they are no longer required. In addition, the cogitation matrix replacing the damaged portions of your skull is based on my own design and programming. You should experience a drastic increase in your reaction times, memory, and special reasoning. Furthermore, you are, as is to be expected, more resilient to damage. Atra let out a low whistle and brightened notably at the fact she was still capable of doing that. It sounds almost like you tried to turn me into something like you. I did take inspiration from the Emperor's work. Astartes have survived and fully recovered from similar damage. It was only logical to mimic some elements of our own biology when attempting to allow you to do the same. Ah. He raised a hand and issued an order. You are explicitly forbidden from sparing with Constantine for at least three weeks. If not more if my examination of you at that time demands it. Atra raised her one remaining eyebrow. Does this also include a link that lets you read my mind? She asked. No, though in hindsight that would have been very useful. I was actually predicting Constantine's behavior. Morn admitted. However, you are capable of engaging in combat, which will be necessary. In the meantime, you will come and assist me with repairing our storm to learn. We will require it for our next mission. He said, then turned to depart. Our next mission? Atra asked, following the marine. Correct. The Xeno is engaged in some manner of subterfuge. It is time that we engage them on our own terms. We will conduct an investigation into Alvara Primus. There were two kinds of rain on Alvara. In some places it was the same as it was throughout all of the Imperium where acrid pollutants from the hives mixed with the water in the air, and it sent down an acrid bombardment. It was a foul time to be out, a stinking rain that made the skin itch, though not strong enough to hamper sturdy steel unless it collected. But in other places, far out on the bridges, or on the open seas between the hives, it was an older rain. Ancient legend said that Holy Terror once was very much like Alvara, a world covered in bountiful oceans. Some trickery had led to the end of that, and the great seas were gone, 
covered over in miles of permacrete and gold. Perhaps in the youthful days of humanity, when we were yet naive and innocent, it rained softly. You would find that kind of rain out on the open and free seas, or on the great bridges. The Imperium had not killed Alvara yet, her oceans preserved her. Their bounty was key to feeding the hives that poisoned her rains, and other worlds nearby. They could not dredge up her bounties from the great depths, nor could their cities sprawl out all across her. The ancient hives were all the places the Imperium could stand upon this world. And the Imperium had not built them. Such was the case for many hives throughout the Imperium. Ancient structures of the Dark Age of Technology, captured and built upon by the growing reach of the God Emperor. These hives were such a sort, rooted in the mantle of the world, complex and crafted to an extent humanity could no longer replicate. The humans of old had built complex systems into them, limiting their effect upon the planet. This too was a testament to that strange time. It must have been a gentler one, to expend resources on such a system. A gentler hive, from a gentler world, like a dream that fades on waking. The rain that fell on the hive was gentler than most in the hives, blown in from the south and west, covering the whole horizon. The green-blue sky, marred by haze, vanished under a gently rolling torrent. The grey-black clouds poured down on the city a silver-grey rain, washing away the blood and smog for a brief moment. It caught on buildings and ran down into pools, dragging the soot and dirt with it. A drop struck the spire clear, and hit the bottom black as tar. They left strange trails of muck, hissing from the heat of the city. The hissing rain left its detritus behind and rose in a silver pure mist that blanketed the mid-levels of the city. It was out into this mist and the somewhat clear rain that Morn and Atra silently went. They moved with solemnity towards the storm Dlan, accompanied by several tech adepts. They labored in silence over the bellicose machine, steadily dismantling the damaged rotors and bearing each piece back to the forges. There were no spare parts for such a rare and valuable machine, so each one would be remade. The mantras of reforging and rebirth rang through the hottest sections of the forge. Around them sacred oils were gathered, and strong incense burned. It was filled with a fiery character to please and rouse the warlike machine spirit. As they labored, Atra heard their words, but did not listen. She was no tech priest, and had no right to hear their sacred incantations. They did ring familiar to her, the scents and songs alike. She recognized the purpose of several oils, though she had never seen them before. She pondered this strange familiarity for a moment as she walked back outside. She looked out briefly past the storm till and into the swirling silver mists. In spite of all her situation, they filled her with some joy. These were among her first memories. The small hab block she had lived in was lucky enough to have a small window. She remembered sitting, looking out at the mists and daydreaming when she was meant to be reviewing her scholar work. She liked to pretend she could see her father in the mists, bravely fighting against the Xeno and the heretic, as had his before him, and so it had been for generations. She wondered what he would think of her now. He was with the Emperor, as was the fate of all guardsmen. Not merely him, but all that long line of hero ancestors. She never met him, any of them. She never set foot on Holy Cardia, whose blood ran in all Alvaran veins. She'd never even been in the same segmentum. What would they think of her now, those legendary cousins? She started when a figure emerged from the mists, and she realized her steps had faltered. She began to redouble them, then halted and came to attention. It was Constantine. She saluted smartly, flinching slightly as her metal arm made a click where it struck the augments on her eye. The Templar stopped, and the two stood there in the rain a moment. It bounced off his armor, shrouding him in a silver halo. She stood there as well. Did he even recognize her? Bald, misshapen, and with as much metal as flesh. Constantine raised his fist and clasped it to chest, returning her salute. Atra. He said, and released the salute. She did as well. He began to move forwards and touched for where the tip of his sword should be, then paused as he recalled its absence. Heal quickly. I look forwards to training with you again. And that was all. The sun of dawn passed her by, and she went back to work and wondering. Constantine entered the Manufactorum with a small smile under his helmet. 
He had sensed the time had come to leave his prayers and knew now it was no mere intuition. The Emperor knew his own, and preserved the worthy, even if in the guise of the machine god. He quickly sought out Aishvan. It was time to get his sword back. He found the salamander towards the back of one of the larger forging chambers. Aishvan had claimed some space for himself, and nearby lay an anvil, hammer, and blacksmith's tools. He had removed his armor to better work, and now stood clad in only the under tunic. Constantine's fingers twitched slightly at the sight of him. The salamander's gene seed was tainted by their home world, mutating all who received it. Beneath the armor, Aishvan's body was unnaturally dark, black as coal, and his eyes glowed crimson as he labored. It was a paradox in Constantine's mind. Mutation was a sign of spiritual corruption, a malformed soul reflected in the body. But the salamanders were unquestionably loyal, among the most loyal of all the emperor's servants. None expressed the love the emperor had for the common people of the Imperium more so than they. Yet they were accursed, mutant. Constantine himself could think of no faults in his battle bro. Cousin. Save perhaps for insufficient hatred, but then again, he'd seen his rage against the lictor. The salamanders were masters of flame, perhaps they simply controlled and did not lose their fury as readily as the Templars. Cousin. Constantine said, letting his presence be known. Ah, your timing is providential brother, I have almost finished the repairs and modifications. Aishvan said with his usual pleasant mood. Modifications? Constantine asked. What modifications? What have you done to my sword? He did not feel fear, but there was a certain level of apprehension at the idea of his blade being altered. Even a slight change in the balance would potentially throw him off. You recall how they do not produce the requisite power cells? Well they did not produce the correct kind of energy ring either. I have been forced to work in a slightly different direction, but I believe it should be to your liking. Aishvan replied. Hold a moment longer, the etching is cooling now. Constantine waited, as Aishvan made the last few touches, then rose and turned. What he had done to the blade made Constantine stare. It had already been a finely made weapon, but only that. Where once there was only a plain, if effective sword, there was now a magnificent work. The crossgood had been reworked into an imperial aquila, the central activation switch now the symbol of the Templars on one side, and that of the Death Watch on the other. The blade itself seemed made from dragon scale, woven through with burning threads, and blew along the edge. Along the blade were etched words in high gothic in the Promethean script. Add Vigilia to Vigilance. This and Atra's arm. You have been a remarkably busy blacksmith, Constantine remarked. Those fibers, they are energy coils. The god emperor made sleep somewhat more optional for us, what would I be if I did not take advantage of that? As for the coils, see for yourself. Aishvan replied, and handed the blade to his friend. Constantine felt its weight, still balanced, though slightly heavier to accommodate for the new features. It would take practice to use perfectly again, but it was not intrusive. He thumbed the activation key, then pressed it. He watched as the coils between the scales ignited, and with a hum, and a whoosh, the blade came to life. The coiling power fields lapped over one another, and coated the blade in golden flame, blew hot around the edge where the power field stood strongest. This is truly incredible cousin. Your chapter's reputation is entirely deserved. On the count of craftsmanship or pyromania? Aishvan asked. Both. Aishvan chuckled, and smiled knowingly. Fire cleanses, as the Ekelshiaki is so fond of saying. It is hope to humanity, and a terror to its enemies. Though I'm afraid it's more of a compensation in this case than an upgrade. Ah. Constantine said, deactivating the sword and sheathing it. As I once heard a rogue trader say, what's the catch? The power field around the edge is not nearly as powerful. It will not part armor as easily as it did before. It's the unfortunate consequence of the weaker cells and ring. Constantine explained. However, with the fire weave, whatever it does part shall be all the worse off for it. I'd not fancy taking a blow from this myself. Constantine muttered in acknowledgement. Even his own superhuman physiology would have difficulty withstanding a blow from such a devastating weapon. 
swift as a sword, but devastating as an axe. It would mangle on a molecular level, superheat blood to the point of instantaneous evaporation, causing miniature explosions all throughout the body, and trigger heat shock through the entire body, flash frying anything not immediately destroyed. This weave, it's the same type used by the Sororitas? Constantine nodded. Godwin D's Excelsis, commonly used in the Blessed Blades, and my own chapter's more complex items. It seemed fitting given your own fervor. You honor me more than you know. Constantine said. He looked at the weapon with some degree of awe. It brought to mind images of the God Emperor's own flaming blade, and while only the palest imitation of that divine artifact, it provided him great comfort. You are my battle brother. How could I do anything less than my very best work? Ishvan replied. Xenobiology, blacksmithing, what next? Do you speak Elder? Constantine asked curiously. No, but oh I can talk proper like if oh I needs to. Ishvan replied, in guttural orkish. I have no idea what that means. Constantine admitted. But I've fought enough greenskins to recognize their tongue. It seems your skill with the flamer is the least of your talents. The salamander shrugged. The flamer is a deceptively simple weapon to master. I have slightly more spare time to develop my other skills than you do. Constantine prepared to answer, when their ears picked up a loud whir, and then an explosion. That was the landing pad our ship was on. Operative word being was. Ishvan looked to his armor. I'll be a moment. Go. Constantine nodded, and ran upwards towards the landing pad. As he moved, the sounds of further explosions rocked the Manufactorum. Morn, what in the God Emperor's name is going on up there? He voxed ahead. I am uncertain. Morn admitted. But it seems quite clear that the Manufactorum is under attack. Cousin I am not deaf I can tell that. Who? Cannot confirm at this time. Lads, I recognize the sound, and you're not going to like it. Wathin cut in. The shells landing are Earthshaker, that's Basilisk fire. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. A few minutes before the shells began to fall, Matthias was standing outside the lift which would take him up to the Manufactorum. He stared at it, somewhat pale, as if it were the inside of a heavy flamer rather than a lift. It had been days since his captain had gone to the aid of the Astartes, and he had heard nothing. There had been no report on her. The rest of the command squad, the entire astropathic choir, and every member of the guard assigned to protect them were listed as dead. But the captain on the other hand wasn't even listed Mia. If the reports were to be believed, then she was alive and well. Which led to the question of where in the god emperor's name she was after a battle that catastrophic. Matthias had considered that there were three likely options. The first was that she was dead, and the Astartes were concealing that fact to preserve morale. This seemed the most likely to him, but considering how his last encounter with the space marines had ended, he wasn't about to ask them. The second was that she had been injured, and so he had checked with any and all medical staff. The medic with the squad had reported she had seen the captain, badly injured taken in a Valkyrie towards the Manufactorum. He had only recently discovered this kernel of information, after two days of digging. It was still more likely that she was dead, but it at least laid to rest the third possibility, one that was all but impossible, but still had haunted him, that for whatever reason, she had turned from the Emperor's light, and simply been erased, forgotten from history. He considered this possibility slightly less likely than Morn showing up for tea and biscuits, but it still nagged at him. He recalled an old parable blessed is the mind too small for doubt. Sometimes he wondered if the Ogrins, abhuman as they were, were actually among the most blessed of all the god emperor's servants because of that. Still, the trail led here, 
to the Malfatorum. So he summoned his courage, and entered the lift shaft. As he rose, he felt his headache beginning to grow worse from the binary wine. He had slept little, busy managing the regiment back into something resembling a proper structure after morns, not decimation. Decimation would have been a mercy, obliteration, of the prior command structure. In between focusing on that he had attempted to track down his supposed superior officer. If she was to be the new colonel, as Matthias suspected she would be, given the Astarte's favor of her, she would need to know every detail. And, much as he layered it in practical, logical arguments to sway the Mechanicus as best as he was able, he simply was concerned for her. He emerged from the lift shaft about midway up the Manufactorum, and quickly attempted to find his bearings. The interior of the factory temple was as alien to him as the seafloor, and he did not belong here any more than he did there. He moved with faint purpose, acting as if he knew where he was going, and that it was also very important that he got there. He engaged a practiced nobleman's stride which was about as useful on the servitors as any other sort of social interaction, then abandoned it for just getting around them. As he maneuvered away from the ghoulish servants, he glanced back and shivered. Nobody liked servitors, except the Mechanicus, and he wasn't entirely certain about that. He looked forwards and stopped, backpedaling away swiftly. The green armor and black hood and cape of Andriel swept by him. His breath caught in his throat, heart skipping a beat. It then plummeted to the core of the planet when the Dark Angel turned and looked at him balefully. He took another two steps away from the librarian, then remembered himself and saluted. Atra is above, yes she is alive, no she is not well, her plasma gun overloaded and she's been rebuilt primarily out of cybernetics, yes somewhat like that catachin but no she's still wearing her shirt. Andriel told him curtly. No, you may not see her but yes I will inform her of your concerns and of her duties, and no I cannot confirm or deny whether she will be the new colonel. Matthias paused, stunned speechless. And because I am a sicker, therefore I can read your mind more quickly than you can speak, and thus do not need to spend as much time dealing with you, as I cannot be bothered to waste time making you mortals feel comfortable around that which you rightly fear. Now go away. You have no responsibilities here that vastly more experienced and qualified servants of the Emperor are not already attending to. Andriel concluded, and turned away. Matthias stood flabbergasted, attempting to process what had just happened. Andriel hadn't shot him, that was a good thing. Atra was alive, that was a good thing. Andriel could read his every thought before he even had them, that was, well Andriel was on his side, and also he knew he was loyal, so it wasn't a bad thing, but that didn't make having it done any less uncomfortable. His headache was growing substantially worse, and there was an uncomfortable buzzing in his brain. He started back to the lift. He'd gotten the answers he wanted, though he hadn't seen Atra personally. It occurred to him that Andriel could be lying to him, the Dark Angels were infamous for their secrets, but even if he was, it wouldn't matter. He'd been ordered to leave, and so he was going to leave. His headache began to pound, and he staggered, falling to his side and holding onto the wall. The buzzing in his head became more intense an all-consuming ringing which drowned out all other noise. It pulsed, beating like a heart. He felt nauseous, and then felt his limbs go limp, losing all feeling to them. What was this? It reminded him almost of the Genestealer's cyclic attack. Was Andriel doing this? The all-consuming buzzing, chittering, screaming roaring drowned his ears, and he felt nothing. He tasted nothing for the first time in his life. He could now describe what his mouth had tasted like. His sense of smell on the other hand intensified. He drew in breaths, of some sweet and astounding scent, like, well he had no words for it, every breath filled his mind with euphoria even as his brain was filled with a tornado of shattered glass and chain swords. He nearly slipped away into the strange convocation of sensation, but some part of him registered that his eyes were still working. In fact it felt like he saw more or saw differently. He registered the servitors no longer with fear, but with animal analysis. Prey. Weak. More food. Less food. Threat. The last descriptor came as his eyes fell on Andriel. The Dark Angel had fallen to a knee, staff raised high. Arcane energies swirled around him, and the tech adepts backed away, 
chittering in their strange cant. They staggered and stumbled, as if they were drunk, or something beneath had shaken them. Strange, he didn't recall looking towards Andriel, and why was he getting closer? Feeling returned in one of his fingers, the familiar grip of his hotshot pistol. A flood of memories struck him, throwing him off his feet and into the swirling mists of Alveria. He remembered the day he received them. He was 12 standard years of age, time enough for him to have a weapon of his own. How massive the pair of pistols had seemed at the time, their warm fur wooded grip, the brilliant and bright focusing lens. He remembered the careful maintenance each evening, against water and weir, to honor the weapons he used. Death he had dealt. Orc boys, near enough to his men to charge, cut down, concentrated beam punching through primitive helm and through the brain, renegades from a planet's PDF, unorganized, scattering under the guns. In the cold decks of battleships on sea and star, in the titan deadly fighting the Alvaran specialized in. The librarian, Andriel, fighting off the cyclic attack himself, on his knees, with only a hood, not a helmet. Wait, no stop. He saw his arm raise, the pistol leveled at Andriel's exposed head. Stop. Stop me. I'm not in control. Help. He screamed, but his mouth did not open. It hung, drooling, and he began to pull the trigger. The LAS bolt went wide, a ceiling and floor spun and began indistinct from one another. He hit the ground, hand already on the other pistol. His body fired it towards the center of the rising mass that was Andriel, but it stuck harmlessly on a psychic barrier. The librarian jerked his staff to the side, and the other pistol went flying out of hand. He then pulled it back, and he rushed forwards no, Matthias was flung though the air towards him. He froze in front of the space marine's enraged face, and Andriel placed a hand on his forehead. Lightning tore through Matthias' body, and he began to scream. The space marine forced their eyes to meet, and Matthias fell. His soul seemed to tumble from its disconnected frame, through iron walls and stone corridors, out into the void. But the void did not freeze him, and it was not dark. For an eternal instant he burned, in lights too countless and alien to describe. Then he fell towards a golden beam, like the sun, like forces so potent that they were only found in nature. But not a nature, a godlike soul, piercing the immaterium like a spine-mounted lance cannon. He fell into that golden infinity, and felt his whole being come apart. He did not burn, what was felt was so utterly beyond burning that it lacked words. He fell to the ground, his mouth full of blood. He'd bitten the tip of his tongue off. His eyes were bleeding as well, and, well, he hoped that was blood leaking out of his ears and not his brain. He spat out the tip of his tongue and spat blood hurriedly so as to not choke. The bleeding stopped, or rather was stopped, as he felt the rest of feeling return. He could hear again, feel again, smell something other than that awful intoxication again. There were roaring booms, and the floor beneath him shook. An artillery bombardment. The Tyranids don't have artillery. He slurred. He shouldn't be speaking that clearly, he'd, ah uh, it was back. No, but they don't have LAS pistols either, and yet one just shot one at me, using you. Andriel explained. It appears the attack was widely directed. Attack? Matthias asked, still confused. I, oh, by the god emperor I tried to shoot you, twice. And then ah, uh, what, what was? Was that the Astronomicon? I've heard navigators describe it like that. Did you just throw me, or, my mind, or my soul or whatever into the Astronomicon? Of course not. There would be nothing left if I had, and if I were that powerful they would have sent just me to deal with the invasion. Andriel replied. I simply purified your mind. Which is why you are saying literally everything you think. I have removed all internal restraints as well as a side effect of the purification. Well I have no idea what any of that meant but I'm scared shitless of you already and confused and generally entirely out of sorts and really don't want to be here. God Emperor's balls I need a drink and a lie down but nope, getting bombarded, and oh god emperor I can't stop talking please someone shut me up before the astards shoot me oh and then he shut up. You have been shut up. Andriel replied. You should return to normal, eventually. I don't know how long it takes mortals. 
and I wouldn't shoot you. I would simply sever every blood vessel in your head and disassemble your blood brain barrier. Saves ammunition. Matthias stared at the dark angel. Had he just made a joke? I found it funny. Andriel remarked. Go find your guns. You'll need them. Another blast sounded through the factorum. I can't do purification at Basilisk range, and it takes a bit of time. The first that Morn and Atra knew of the attack was when a missile struck the storm Talon as they were approaching it. The explosion blew both back, Atra hopping slightly to stay on her feet. Then another hit, and another and another, and the pair retreated swiftly inside the manufactorum as shrapnel flew. Atra registered one large piece flying towards her eye, when the refractor field deflected it away, and she ducked behind cover. Morn slammed his fist into the door controls, slamming the great shutters close before the bombardment could spread. Outside, they could hear the groan of straining metal, and the crash as the landing pad fell off the side of the building. The building began to shake, as more explosions resounded off all around her. What in the drowned hells was that? Atra shouted. When the feth did the nids get manticore missiles? I don't know. You purged the Jenna Steelers, and that could have only come from one of the defenses I mounted. Morn growled. Whoever is responsible, he paused, shaking in fury, before he calmed himself and spoke calmly, deliberately, and in the most terrifying tone Atra had ever heard. They blew up my ship. They are dead. It was then that they received Wathin's message. Acknowledged. I guessed as much. Morn asked. Where are you that you can hear them? In the building. Where else? Wathin replied. Why are you in the manufactorum? Morn asked. Educating a fetching young biologist lass on the finer points of a start's anatomy, clearing up a few misconceptions. Wathin replied. Morn paused for a moment. Very well. Meet us in central command. We must evaluate the situation in more detail. And for the Omnigia's sakes, wear your helmet, the enemy may have heavy bolters now. The kill team ray assembled in the central control room, where already several monitors displayed various tech priests, as well as the canoness of the Cathedral of St. Augustina. Constantine nodded at her as he entered. The Emperor protects. Indeed he does, though several of our younger sisters have been given his peace, for their faith was not strong enough. It is the entire city then? Morn asked as he entered, face grimmer than usual. Not merely the city tech brother. The local Margos, a mess of wires and tubes that was only vaguely humanoid, replied. The attack has fallen on all remaining hives. Planet wide? That shouldn't be possible. Morn growled. Well it has been done. The Margos replied. You're both correct, it shouldn't be possible, but somehow it's been done. Andriel replied as he entered the room. Matthias trailing close behind him. It was a single cyclic attack, targeting the entire planet. I can feel it in the air, tense as a wire. Whatever is doing this has stretched themselves thin to accomplish it, but it's been done. I suppose that explains why they targeted our astropaths. If it's spreading itself that thin, then any sicker could pierce it. Atra acknowledged. Yes, but that doesn't explain why none of us were affected. It targeted me, but that was a direct attack, not part of the wider spell. Andriel explained. I brushed that off without any difficulty at all. However it didn't affect any of us, or the Mechanicus, or Atra. To put it in low gothic, it's hard to mind control a toaster, but that can't be all of it. What's a toaster? Constantine asked. Irrelevant. The Margos replied. The Omnigia protects us with logic. Clearly he has also shielded the Guards woman. That leaves us. Ishvan replied as he entered, donning his helmet as he did so. Is everyone going to announce themselves by cutting in on the conversation? The Margos replied, mildly annoyed at how cramped his control room was starting to get. Ishvan politely ignored him. Andriel, do you think it's synaptic in nature? Possible. It certainly felt like the hive mind, but, he frowned. There is something else, something more than the mere animal mind directed. It is something else, something more, something worse, and I do not know what. For the first time, he sounded concerned, almost afraid. 
there was something in this alien even to him. If the Tyranid could do this, it would do it more often. This is something else, something using the Tyranids as much as our guardsmen. Regardless of what it is, the real question is what do we do? Constantine asked. The Manufactorum is a formidable defense, but it cannot hold forever. Bring up the long range or specs. Morn ordered. Show us the status of the fleet. A nearby screen appeared, flashing through images with incredible speed. Even the other Astart struggled to keep up, but Morn watched with cold analysis. The high fleet is scattered, the main forces are now moving to provide relief. He explained. However, the enemy controls the planetary guns, and we have no way to contact the fleet. They're walking right into a trap. Constantine growled. It will be a massacre, and without support from the fleet, Elvira will fall. Then holding out is not an option. Morn replied. We will find the source of this attack, and destroy it. For the Emperor. Alright, all very dramatic and all that, but how exactly do we plan on doing that? Constantine asked. We are currently trapped in a factory with all the defenses we constructed shooting at us. We don't know what's responsible, where it's coming from, or how to stop it. It's coming from the central hive, and whatever vector they're propagating the synaptic signal with most likely came with the rain. Ishvan, after several minutes of pondering. Andriel blinked. Brother I will not fault you for your poor understanding of psychic powers, but you cannot convey them through water. It only looks like electricity. Not the water, what's in it? Ishvan replied. I hypothesize that the synaptic relay is being bounced through a waterborne tyrannid microorganism, one hour enhanced physiology and the cybernetics of the Mechanicus kill, some sort of variant on the same organism they used to break down a planet's microbiosphere. That's, HM, well considering they can engineer a psychic hood to be grown like an organ, and their brains are designed in arcane sigils, Andriel grumbled. There isn't enough mind in a bacterium to have any psychic potential. It would be utterly fantastic for there to be telepathic germs. A single one perhaps, but a collective of millions, billions, trillions, operating within a local structure, rapidly reproducing inside a host body, a network within the larger network, Ishvan explained. A microcosm of the Tyranid on a microscopic level, all to act just as a connector. Andriel pondered for a moment. Yes I can follow your logic. But how exactly did you come to this conclusion just on the rain? Simple. There are no Tyranids in the Hive City, but there must be Tyranids in order to project the Hive Mind. We eliminated their forces in the Underhive, and considering we have a Titan protecting that entry point now, we'd have known if they moved something in. It therefore had to infiltrate by another method, and the only new variable is the rain. Ergo. They came in through the rain, ergo they must be some manner of microscopic organism. Furthermore, the storm came from the direction of the capital, which the Xeno retains control of. Yes, that does make sense. Which means the origin point of all this blasphemy is there, in the fallen capital. Constantine agreed, and slammed his fist into his palm. Which means we can crush it. Margos. We require your fastest ship. Ours has been destroyed. You are in my Manufactorum Templar. The Margos replied with a binary snarl. I am not some chapter surf you may compel. Beyond that, we do not manufacture aircraft or voidcraft here, only seafaring vessels. If you attempted to cross the seas with both the Xeno and the Alvaran navy against you, you would almost certainly be destroyed. Additional point. The Margos of Alvara Tetris cut in through the view screen. Your absence will jeopardize the STC. Morn, have most certainly calculated this. I have. Morn replied. However, if we remain here then we will almost certainly be overwhelmed. Even if we had the numbers to repel the guard, or the prepared positions, we cannot face both Alvira's military and the Tyranid at once. No support is coming that will not be obliterated by the city's defenses. Adopting a defensive position will result in our defeat and the loss not only of the STC, but the entire planet, in 100% of cases. I calculate if we can find a way to reach the central hive, we have roughly a 7.689% chance of achieving limited victory. At this stage, 
Absolute victory is an utter impossibility. The mood became, if at all possible, even more grim at that statement. Absolute victory was impossible. Even if the invasion could now be stopped, Alvaro would never be the same. In all likelihood, every man, woman, and child that remained entirely human was already damned. Morn pronounced their doom with grim resolve. Woth invisibly gripped his teeth, fists clenching. Ishvan was utterly silent. Andriel nodded in solemn agreement, and Constantine fumed in his armor. Atra simply stood shell-shocked by the pronouncement. She was still attempting to process the entire situation, there was simply too much that had occurred over the past few days. She sat down, eyes staring off into nothing, and went exceedingly pale. Matthias was little better, still rattled from the attack and his subsequent revival, he nearly fainted. Then he paused, and spoke. No, it's not. You can break the ability. That's why they tried to kill all the sickers. I'm free of it now. So, if we can find some way of neutralizing the Tyranids, we may still be able to revive our people. Andriel turned to the noble. Your A awakening nearly destroyed you, and I do not have the ability to project it on a wide field. The counter prevailing forces are too strong. He explained. I cannot save your people. So we find the thing responsible and we kill it. If it's something this powerful then it would throw the high fleet into disarray, and allow the reinforcements fleets to land and retake Alvara. Then we could fix my people. The psychic backlash of the entity's death will very likely kill most, and drive most of the survivors insane. There will be very few left. Andriel replied. But there will be some. Matthias answered, not budging. And perhaps the mad ones can be helped. I will not allow you to write off my people, to write off my planet is lost. Morn turned towards him. Your planet is lost, in all probability. We cannot change that. Matthias turned, and flinched under the Tetchmarine's glare. He looked away, breathing heavily, then gathered his courage and stared the marine down. You came to protect this world. You have fought alongside us, and you know that we are worth saving. You didn't abandon Atra. Don't abandon the rest of us. We are loyal. I have been under this spell. I know every last one of the men firing at you is screaming at themselves to stop. We are not traitors, and we are not lost. Morn looked down at the furious adjutant, and a kernel of respect blossomed for him. Yes, he was loyal, overly loyal to his own world perhaps, but such was to be expected. There were also benefits to keeping some survivors, they could be screened, processed, the resilient determined for what they were and used to compose new generations of resilient individuals. Even the weak or mad could be useful to analyzing this new weapon of the enemy. He nodded. I give you my word. I will protect your people, for they are the emperors. Matthias nodded. Check the territories of the noble houses, they maintain private craft some for more militaristic pursuits than others. You might find something you can use there. We can use. Morn corrected him. We will require every available asset for this mission. You and Atra will both be assisting us. Psychological profile indicates you are not stupid enough to attempt to order the Mechanicus in this manner Morn. The Margos intervened. We will prioritize protecting the STC at any cost. This world may burn for all we care. But the STC must be preserved. I expected no less. Morn replied. My advice, not order, is that all available forces rally here, and you construct a vehicle capable of escaping orbit. If we fail, this planet will fall, and to prevent the spread of this scourge to other words, it will most likely be subjected to the ultimate sanction, no mere cleansing with the life eater virus, but the total destruction of the world. Wathin growled in agreement. The Inquisitan have sundered worlds for less than what has occurred here. Best to leave now and start running, they'll be on your scent once they learn of this. Matthias looked to Ishvan, who nodded. The officer returned the nod gratefully, and then helped Atra to her feet and out the door. He sat her down on a nearby bench, and checked her over. She was still completely out of it, overwhelmed by the stress of the past few days. Atra? Captain Atra can you hear me? He asked. Atra looked towards him, seeming to come back from her trance. 
She closed her eyes, and breathed slowly and deeply. Her emotions still raged within her, a torrent of anger and fear and sorrow that threatened to overwhelm her. She couldn't even begin to process all of it, it was just too much. She wanted to break down and cry, or scream, or break something all at once. Then she recalled what had just occurred. She'd gone out of it, completely gone, and left Matthias to cover for her. Shame and anger filled her, and gave the anger response the leverage it needed to overwhelm the others. She shook with fury, her arm burned. Matthias stepped aside, and she snapped, exploding outwards in a moment of violent rage. Her metal fist hit the opposite wall with enough force to crumple it. Her arm cooled, blue light within dimming. She paused, breathing heavily for a moment before she composed herself somewhat. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have made you face them yourself. I'm the superior officer now, I'm supposed to act like it. I don't blame you at all. Matthias replied. All this, it's just too much. Maybe they are made for it but you and I, we're mortals. This is something nobody should have to deal with, let alone that on top of what you've been through. God Emperor, I almost didn't recognize you. That was the wrong thing to say. Atra visibly flinched, the grinned bitterly. I mean you're not wrong. I don't even really look human anymore. Like one of their bloody servitors. Wonder if my hair will ever grow back, or will I need to get one of those ridiculous wigs? I know a good manufacturer. Matthias replied kindly. And you'll be able to afford it with officer's pay. Atra snorted. I suppose, assuming there's a regiment left to lead. Still got me captain. Matthias replied. Yeah. I guess I do. Atra replied, smiling slightly, tiredly. God I need an Amzek, or to sleep for a month. Don't think we'll have time for the former, but I'll see what I can bring up for the later. Not good to drink on mission, so we'll set it aside for when we've won. 7% chance of even partial victory. Atra reminded him, I'll get the good stuff then. 7% is really worth celebrating. Meanwhile, back in the command room, Morn was flicking through the extensive lists of properties owned by the Spire Nobles. They flew big at speeds only a superhuman could process, and he examined each in turn. He frowned, there was nothing that truly suited their purposes, but then he found something interesting. Access denied. The cogitator beeped at him pleasantly. Something we don't have access to? Constantine asked, surprised. Did you accidentally check an inquisitor's file? I do not cause accidents. Morn replied. And you forget we are an order militant. We are, in some manner, an arm of the Inquisition, there should be very little we cannot access. No, we aren't, and I never will be. Wathin replied, snarling. His long fangs gleamed. And imply I am again and you and I will have words. Noted. Morn replied, and began attempting to access the restricted file. Access denied. Access denied. Access denied. Morn simply placed his hand to the screen, and a terrible piercing whine resonated through the air, so loud even the astards reflexively cover their ears. Recognized. The mechanical voice replied, Welcome Scree. And then it faded. Was that really necessary? Wathin asked, shaking his head to clear the ringing. Something of a last resort to get through. The file, whatever it was, was heavily encrypted. I simply overrode it through brute force. Morn replied. Let's see here. Yes, I think we might have an answer. Lord Morath was hiding something, some manner of advanced prototype. Project Equinox. Double quote. Prototype? Is it a weapon? Ishvan asked. Better. It's some sort of stealth ship. Morn replied. Though considering some of the details, I see why he kept it secret. Its armament's ability is only matched by how restricted it is. Nothing of the warp, but some of the technology appears to be based on Elder designs, assuming he wasn't foolish enough to use their technology directly. Constantine blinked. You expect us to use an Elder ship? Those things run on witchery and blasphemous sorcery. No. I expect you to use an Imperial ship that may have some designs based on Elder technology. Considering we do not have access to Wraithbone, 
there will be no arcane components. I suspect it is an imitation. Simply because someone other than me would have shot him by now if it was fully Zenitech. As it is, this seems to dance dangerously along the line. And we're going to use it. Constantine sighed. I shall have to make an additional appointment to use the paint glove for purification. Wait that actually exists? Andriel asked. I thought it was a myth. It exists. Constantine confirmed. It is a highly effective form of mediation. Alternatively, Njod. Wathin suggested. If pain is weakness leaving the body, best to have it go all the way through. I don't think that's pain. Ishvan replied. Lightweight. The Astartes began to depart, discussing the optimal route to the hidden hangar. Atra rose, raising her arm in a salute as they passed. Ishvan paused for a moment. I will be a moment, Atra, a word. He replied. Atra nodded, and followed the marine as he stepped aside. If even Ishvan was angry with her, then she was well and truly doomed. Still, she did her best to hold herself upright. My lord, before anything else, I wish to sincerely apologize for my moment of weakness. It was utterly inappropriate for an officer of the guard and... Ishvan raised a hand for her to stop, then stepped forwards and wrapped his arms around her. He drew her into a gentle hug, holding her close. There is nothing to apologize for. What has occurred is a horror which would break any mortal, that you still stand as a testament not to your weakness, but to your strength. Atra shook for a moment, and then collapsed, sagging forwards and beginning to cry. It's too much. She said quietly. My world is gone, my comrades are gone, even my body is gone, and my duty is greater than ever before. It's too much, I'm not strong enough to deal with all of this. Considering the dents you keep putting the walls, I think you may be stronger than you give yourself credit for. Ishvan replied. But yes, it's a heavy burden. I'm not even entirely certain I and my brothers can bear it. But we're the only ones who have a chance. The strong have a duty to fight for the weak, even when the odds seem impossible, even when they can barely move under their burdens, we must keep fighting. Because we are the only hope for the world. You are a miserable comforter-ish. It's not as though there wasn't enough pressure already. Pressure creates adamantine. The salamander replied. And perhaps it will not make you feel better, but it must give you the strength to keep moving. Duty is not a burden, it is the strength which pushes us to become more than we are. That is the true power of humanity, to continually evolve and improve, to face the impossible challenge and to make it possible. No foe shall be beyond our wrath, and no star beyond our grasp, for it is our destiny to claim the cosmos, and defend it against all invaders. I'm not even sure if I really qualify as human anymore. Atra confessed. Am I not human then? Ishvan asked. What makes a human is their soul, and neither steel nor gene tailoring can alter that. We are all human, each one in the god emperor, and together we will be stronger than the trials which surround us, even if we stumble or crack. We are both the defenders of humanity, angel of death, and hammer of the emperor. While we yet draw breath, until all our blood is poured out and every bone is crushed, Alvaro is not yet lost. Atra raised her head, face set with determination. Alvaro is not yet lost. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.